Okay, so that should be it recording. Uh, so welcome guys, we're going to have a look at Height of Tide today. All real life stuff. So, two part question. Firstly, we'll look at what the Height of Tide is. We'll look to work out what the Height of Tide at Greenick is going to be at 1720 on the 19th of September. Then once we have worked that out, we'll take it on one step further and put a little scenario and we'll, we'll turn the scenario back around as well. We'll look at the reactive way and the proactive way, working out what clearance you're going to be left with. And it is just a kind of role reversal. Um, kick things off, 19th of September. So this is taken straight out the almanac. Uh, highlighted that day. So we get four bits of info. We can see we've got uh, a low, uh, sorry, a high tide early in the morning. Then we've got a low tide, high tide, and low tide. So 20 past five was the magical number I'm looking for. And what I do is I try and find the closest high water to my claim. So 17, 20 will slot in between here. Um, and if this was an actual almanac, all I'd do is I'd circle the date and I'll draw a little line in here. Um, with a quick arrow, just to remind me that I want to pick these four bits of info here, and I'm going to discard one of them in a minute, and not this. It's a very common mistake of the theory course to go, right, high water, yeah, we'll have that one, and then it doesn't actually fit in the total code. So the nearest high water I need is 1347. That, as with everything in the almanac, the UT time, GMT, British Winter time, or whatever. Uh, zone you want on that, not summer time. So, what we need to do is add the hour on. So, high water effectively comes 1447. And we do that before we go near the tidal curve. It's a high water tidal curve. Um, and if we just pop over, there's the kind of enlarged version of the Greenwich tidal curve. As I say, it's a high water tidal curve. I just checked down here that says high water. I said I could discard one of the bits of information and that one bit is the, is me, is the low water time. I don't need to know that the low water is at 1900 or 2000. If it's an upside down side of curve and it looks odd and there's none of the, none of the Scottish side of curves are low water, so it's only if you venture to the south coast, there's only about two or three of them and they look upside down and they've got LW in here. So then we would discard the high water time and we would bring in the low water time. But for today, we are going to look at the high water time. 1447, that gets put into the book. Yeah. For those of you who are happy working out tidal streams, if I was working out an hour's tidal stream, I would take 30 minutes off and add 30 minutes on to create an hour don't need to do now is that I can just fill all these boxes in the one hour, two hour, three hour, four hour after. Because each of these little lines are 10 minutes and half an hour uh, every three. So I don't need to create the hour. It's already created for me. I'm just really sticking the data in here. So 1447, 1547, 1647, 17, 18, 19, um, and 20. Don't worry that that doesn't line up with the low water time. Surely a tick in the box exercise or filling in the boxes, and I can almost discard that information. It's a reference to high water that we are looking at. This. So a bit of informa information number one, 1447. Information number two, we've got a high water height of 3.4 meters. Put that in up here. And it's worth throwing a little line just to remind you where that marker is. Same for low water height, 0.1. We are picking the next low water height after high water, which is why we've filled all this in. So it's the low water height at 1900 or 2100 if you were going by BST. Draw a line in there and draw the line across. This becomes our reference line between high water and low water. This, as we've got now, is the tidal curve 
Wait, there's no other information I need to put into this title code. I could use it now to work out any particular height of type from 1447 onwards to, to low water. All I need to do is just draw up these various lines depending on which time um, I need. What I got trained to do when I was doing the longer distance cell training courses is one of our more kind of morning plans was to set the tidal curve up for that day for the full 12 hours. So at any point, anyone could come in, jump onto the tidal curve and go right, like, it's three o'clock in the afternoon, up there, up to the top and find out what the higher tide curve was. And that just means it was running for the day. We didn't have to dive through but find tidal curves and the right information. Um, and it also allows us to work out our tidal streams as well. And um, so there's, there's a multiple use for this tidal curve. We'll put tidal streams to, to bed for now. That can be um, another clinic if desired. So we're looking for 1720. What we've got along here, the closest I can find is 1647. Uh, and for ease of calculation, let's round it up to 1650. Yeah, 1650. Three minutes will make absolutely zero difference when we're talking height of tide. Each of these little lines afterwards are 10 minutes. Uh, and then we've got the slightly kind of duller line there, that's 30 minutes. So if you take that to 1650, then we've got 1700, 1710, and 1720. So this is the line that I want to pick up. I'm only going to go to this first line here, that red dot is. Um, and that's my spring line. And I just have a quick check on this box here. It tells me my average spring rain, but it also tells me which line is springs and neaps. Confirmation that I'm on springs, 3.4 meters here down to 0 0.1. So I've got a 3.3 meter range of height. So it's a little bit above a spring, but I don't have any more flexibility is either spring or a neat line or somewhere in the middle if I was around the kind of two and a half meter uh, range which I'm not so it doesn't matter that it's a bigger spring range just get the spring line run all the way across to here till I meet this line and then what I do is draw a line up you can go down providing you are far enough along the scale that the low water scale will, will give you the answer you want so what we now have is a height of tide at 1720 of 2.1 meters and thinking into the RWA courses their scope for error is about 0.1 either way and it's really down to how accurately you draw this line here followed by that line and that line and also how straight your line is that runs across here so anything in the 2 to 2.2 category in the RWA nav courses world is absolutely fine. In the real world, it does not make any difference. Right? You can probably be down at kind of 1.9 and 1.8 or even up at 2.3, 2.4, and you still might not be right. One big factor that will determine exactly how accurate a height of tide is, is the weather pressure. So diving away from tidal heights for a second, we looked in the almanac a minute ago, and had a 3.4 meter high water height. That is based as all the prep, as well, all the tidal heights are on 1,013 millibars of pressure. But the minute you go and plonk a nice big windy and wet low pressure, that's going to pull your tidal height up. And the minute you go and put a nice big high pressure like we've got today, that's going to push the water down. So it's a bit of a guesstimate. So you can spend a lot of time working a really accurate height of tide calculation out and then go and plunk the boat out there and be well off in some cases. Um, so it's worth just bearing that in mind. Um, don't necessarily go chasing the really accurate tidal height because you may not get it. So 2.1, this is what we are going to take. Let's make it real life for a minute. We've looked at the tidal curves for Greenock uh, and I've extracted one of my favorite anchorages um, up in the Kyles of Butte, up in Kalahaba here. 
and I've circled the kind of deeper bit. Um, and this is quite appropriate. I've, I've made, as you'll see in the next PowerPoint, I've made this a little bit motorboat -y. Purely because I had the motorboat image in the PowerPoint um, prior to this, but it highlights putting a sail training yacht with a two to three meter keel on it. Just overemphasizes what I'm about to say, and you need to be even more cautious. Kala Harbour itself, cracking place to anchor. Um, and there is a couple of mooring boys in there every now and again. But if you've got a deep drafted keel, the minute you kind of wander away from this middle section here, the 5.2 meter depth, you start running into some shallow ground very quickly. Very nasty drying right here. And on some of the charts, that little rock, which is where my person is, isn't actually marked. It's on some of the charts, but not the more. They need to be quite careful. And that's the two meter on the line that's running around there. So look at the anchorage, but you've run out of water really quickly. And if you've got two or three larger boats in there, you've got to be quite persuasive about how you go and plonk a third or fourth large yacht in there uh, or motorboat. And you can very quickly find yourself running out of space. And I'm talking kind of horizontal space on top of the water and under the boat as well. Um, but it's under the boat that we are going to concentrate on today. Uh, and this is assuming that we are kind of running a winter course where no one else is on the water and I can go and plant my boat right in the middle of that 5.2 meter depth. So, scenario one, what will my clearance be at low water? So, we know two bits of information so far. Height of tide, 2.1 meters. So 1720 is the time I I'm going to go and drop the anchor. And I can also work out my depth of water at 17.20. I've got to 7.3. I've got that number by adding what's on the charts, 5.2 meters and the 2.1. The chart of depth, updating on the chart, and the 2.1 meter height and tide gives me my depth of water. So I'm starting with 7.3 meters. This might not be what's on your depth gauge. And I'm going to leave that to the last slide just to kind of explain and leave you guys with a little bit of, kind of thinking to do for future um, checking of your depth gauge on your boat. Let's assume for now, for ease of calculation, that 7.3 is what's on your depth gauge. I want to know once all that tide disappears, because we are working this out on a dropping tide, so we're after high water. First thing I want to know is how far the tide is going to drop between my point now and the next low tide. The next low tide from my tidal curve, 0 0.1, the time I'm not overly concerned with, but my tide will drop two meters. So I'm going to lose two meters from this 7.3 straight away, which pretty much puts me back on that data by 0.1. That drops my boat to there. And it just brings me that much closer to touching the seabed. Watch for what's under the boat. So in this scenario, what I have is a 1.5 meter draft, which is pretty reasonable across most of the power boats uh, and motor boats. And it takes in quite a good percentage of the small yachts as well. I take 7.3. And I take the two meters and I take the 1.5 meters off. I'm left with 3.8 meters. That will be my clearance, assuming that that's right, and my height of tide calculation was right, and my fall of tide was right. Remember, everything is based on average 1013 pressure. As soon as it changes either way, these numbers are going to change a little bit. Draft is about the only fixed one, uh, unless you happen to be in a scenario where you've got a keel that can go up and down. It does happen occasionally. Um, or you're in the scenario that you go, actually, I'm really not that bothered if I do touch the bottom and line the bottom for an hour because my boat uh, could be a twin killed um, twin keel yacht or it could be a rib and you can go actually yeah sitting on the bottom's not that much of a problem i know it's mud under here quite happy to do that and i'm going to lie on the bottom for about 45 minutes and then the tide will start coming back up again 
Um, you're caught then. Definitely not going to put any of my boats uh, near the bottom because a bin keel, a single keeled yacht, and a motorboat with twin uh, twin shafts don't take handy to sitting on the bottom. So the first scenario we're looking at is clearance of low water. So I start with my depth of water, I take away the fall of tide, take away the draft, and I hope that is a positive number. If it's a negative number, it means at some point prior to low water, I'm going to run aground. Or my boat's going to end up sitting on the mud. So it's a little bit of a reactive way of working it out. But I would say it's probably the most common. Uh, and I've lost track in a matter of times. So we've kind of rocked up at Anchorage, stopped, half the crew have gone downstairs, chucked the kettle on, they want a cup of tea. The other half have to kind of chuck the anchor over. We've anchored in plenty of water, not a problem at all. And then I asked the question, what's going to happen at low tide? Are we sitting here tonight? Are we going to be high and dry? And you either get the, uh, yes, I worked it out, here's my answer, and a happy answer, or the most common one, all the crew look at each other and go, you know, we probably should have worked that out. Let's now work it out and hope that's a positive number. Otherwise, we're pulling the anchor back up and going out into deeper water. Unless it's a shorter anchor. Anchorage. So that's one way of looking at it, a kind of reactive way. If we rotate things around, and I'm now doing it the proactive way, and if I just flick back between these two slides, it's this bottom bit here that I'm worried I'm going to uh, watch. So that's a subtract, and that's a subtract. If I put it back onto this one, these two now become a uh, plus. I'm adding everything together. Ultimately, this question, although it says, what's my depth of water to anchor in? I'm really wanting my clearance. So this clearance becomes backed up. So that's the number I start with first. I just end up with this. And this number, the depth of water, that's what your depth gauge needs to show. And I work that out by going, right, I want X amount of meters clearance. I've got X amount of boats sticking under the water. And I know my drop and I know my fall of tide is going to drop by X amount of meters. I add them all together and I get the depth of water that my, uh, I need to anchor in. And also I get the depth of water that my depth gauge needs to show. So, I didn't bother changing the numbers for this. I thought, just, just keep it and I'll show you the, the other way to do it. So exactly the same numbers as before. I've just rotated the entire slide around a little bit. So 3.8, 1.5 meters on my draft, um, two meter fall of tide. And I've drawn a line through this because of A, I will have already worked it out. And B, if I know that, I know that. So it's the fall of tide that's my interesting one, the one I'm overly interested in. And that, if everything has worked the way I want it to work, that is the magical number. And that can't be a negative number. That has to be a positive number because that's what my depth gauge needs. You can play with these numbers all day long. The one that's fixed is, uh, is your draft. The variable is clearance under the boat. So it's really down to how comfortable you are uh, getting up close and personal to the seabed. Many scenarios where I've got down to kind of 0 0.5, 0 0.4, and being pretty comfortable and can actually sleep quite well at night knowing that I'm not going to get down that much further. And then the tide's going to start coming back in. It's a calculated risk. It's the reactive ones where wake up in the middle of the night and hear a banging going, it's either like the anchor dragging, one of the boats tied alongside me, worst case, the boat sat on the seabed. So if you want more clearance, just push that depth of water back up. It means you've got to go and anchor in deeper water. Okay. Certain parts of the Clyde, once you start to move out into the 7 to 10 metre depth, you run out of the ability, unless you've got a lot of anchor down on your boat, and um, you very quickly find yourself running out of anchor chain. Um, 
and it is quite a problem. There's a number of anchorages where seven meters, really comfortable number. You go to 10 meters and you've pretty much got a vertical drop off and the next recorded depth is about four. And, and there's very few boats on the Clyde that will have enough anchor to A, touch the bottom, but B, actually do what an anchor is supposed to do. Um, so worth just bearing that in mind as well. If we're looking at seven meters of water to anchor in or 7.3, We'll do seven because it's an easier mathematical calculation. Just chain, uh, you're looking at four times of depth, so about 28, 30 meters of anchor. If it's chain and rope, you're going to five times of depth, and if it's just rope, you're going to six. So looking at six, we're looking at 40 odd meters uh, of rope to have on board, which is quite a lot. Manageable, but it's quite a lot. Have a quick look at the question box. There's none in there, which is all good, I hope. And um, so, where is the depth measured from? This is the slide that I wanted to leave you guys just as kind of a little bit of, kind of thought process here. It's one of the very first things I check when I get on a new boat, especially doing kind of own boat training. The last thing I want to be responsible for is the customer that I'm doing training for clipping the bottom, um, because we've both calculated different levels of depth and they think they're in deeper water where actually they're not. So you have three scenarios. You've got the first one, which is reading from the waterway. And it needs the depth sensor to be calibrated into the plus. Bring it back up to the waterline. Right, we're doing that. The second one, this is your, your kind of back three version. Transducer will probably be, depending on the hole, in and around the, the mid bit of the hole. It really depends on the setup of the boat and where the gauge is running from. Um, our motorboat, for instance, it runs from the flat bit of the hole, but I've still got another, I think it's about 0.5 of a kill beneath that. Um, and then we've got under the kill. That's the brave one. That's the one where you go, well, I just turned it on and it kind of reads from there and I'm happy for it to read there and I know it's reading from there. And that's the overly cautious one. And I put myself very firmly, I mean, I have no shame at all in going, I'm going to put myself in the, uh, in the cautious category. I don't want sequels uh, keel to touch the ground. Having replaced the two props on our motorboat once, I have no intention of doing it again because it cost an absolute fortune. I was quite happy to keep those props away from the seabed. The advantage of being overly cautious is if I have a quick glance at the depth gauge and it says 0.1, I know the seabed's about there and it is 0.1 underneath the boat. There is no other calculations to do. The minute that goes zero, you are sat on the seabed. If it's for this one, if you are working out a height of tide calculation and you end up with a depth of water, this is the calculation that you won't need to do anything else for if you were working at depth of water. This, your depth gauge is reading the depth of water. You just need to allow the difference between the water line and the bottom of the keel and build that into your tidal height calculations. There is no right and wrong answer to this. It is very much personal preference. One other slight bit that's worth talking about is the, diff the distance between the anchor as it rolls off the front here um, and the water line. So if you're being quite particular about how much anchor chain you've put out, you either need to allow for this, or you need to let another meter, a meter and a half, two meters in some cases, go out over the boat. So your depth, your anchor chain that you've let out, measures from round about the water line and not up here. In this particular scenario, although it's a motorboat, it could equally be a, uh, a yacht. Right, right look, you're thinking of, as I'm talking here, sequel's almost got more distance from its bow to the water line than, uh, than the motorboat does. So it's, it's easily over a meter, if not close to, to 1.5 meters. And that can have quite an interesting effect on whether that anchor is actually going to do what you want it to do on the seabed. So it's worth just, uh, just bearing that in mind. 
a couple of points in this slide to, to think about. Cautious one under the boat. I have never, ever, ever criticised anyone for being overcautious out on a motorboat or a yacht come for that. Ease of calculation, uh, go for the waterline. Uh, and this is the one that you've turned it on. And I did it for a while and I forgot to change anything. I went, yeah, it's zero. I know it's kind of mid, and I did measure the distance between the two. Then I had to change the props. And ever since that point, I've gone into the cautious category and it's firmly stayed there. It also gives me the reassurance that if a student is looking at the depth gauge in the boat uh, and they're a little bit tired or it's been a long day, if it says zero, they're over the seabed. They don't have to do any other calculation. So that's why I chosen that one. Okay, let's 